let me turn to the facts of Tagore's relationship with Gandhi. Tagore had admired Gandhi even before he met him. In 1913, he sent a personal subscription to Gandhi's struggle for the rights of Indians in South Africa. This is actually the handwritten letter is there in the Gokhale papers in the National Archives. He's sending 500 rupees, which he's gathered from his students uh, uh, you know, uh, in Bengal, and he's sending it and saying it's a modest contribution. But you know, for your struggle, this is what I'd like to give you. Tagore's close friend, the English Christian priest Charles Freer Andrews, went to South Africa to work with Gandhi. Tagore spoke glowingly of, uh, sorry, Andrews spoke glowingly of Tagore to Gandhi. Thus, when Gandhi finally returned home to India, he sent an advance party of his ashram, which included three of his sons, to Tagore school in Shantiniketan. And he and his wife followed shortly afterwards. And in fact, he was in Shantiniketan when in February 1915, when he heard of Gokhale's death. Tagore was not there, so he had to go back, and he came back later and met Tagore for the first time. It's a long and very interesting relationship from 1915 till 1941, and there are many aspects that I should not cover here, uh, including some, I mean, the aspects I'll cover here will be slightly more advantageous to uh, uh, Tagore than to Gandhi, but there were other times in which uh, Gandhi showed in a much better light than Tagore, but that will be for a separate occasion. So don't go away with uh, the sense that it was that one-sided. I mean, this particular exchange I'm going to talk about, probably Tagore comes out a little better, but there were other, and if you go to Savasati Bhattacharya's book, supplemented by other readings, uh, for example, uh, Gopal Krishna Gandhi, who's also here, has it, edited a wonderful volume on Gandhi's relations with Bengal, called A Frank Friendship, which also has some previously unpublished correspondence between Gandhi and Tagore on other aspects of their relationship. But I'm going to talk about really Tagore's reaction to Gandhi's non-cooperation struggle of 1920-21. When the non-cooperation movement was launched in early 1921, Tagore was traveling in Europe. His, and he was following the press. So he would get the news, Indian newspaper by post. Uh, there were no internet in those days, but it would come uh, week by week. He would get the newspapers. He would get Gandhi's journal in Young India, which was covering the movement in great detail. He would get letters from his friends, from C.F. Andrews, uh, from his nephews, from his associates in Bengal. They would write to him. And he had ambivalent feelings about the non-cooperation movement. In a letter to Andrews, dispatched from Paris on 18th September 1920, he writes, I see our countrymen are furiously excited about non-cooperation. But he says, I hope this emotion flows on constructive channels. If that happens, I shall be willing to sit at Gandhiji's feet and do his bidding, if he commands me to cooperate with my countrymen in service of love. If he commands me to uh, uh, commit my countrymen to the service of love, I will sit at his feet, but I refuse to waste my manhood in lighting the fire of anger and spreading it from house to house. So like the Swadeshi movement, Gandhi, uh, Tagore worried that the non-cooperation movement would foster an unreasoning hatred of the foreigner. Tagore continues, It is not that I don't feel anger in my heart for the insult and injury heaped on my motherland, but that anger of mine should be turned into the fire of love for lighting the lamp of worship to be dedicated through my country. It would be an insult to humanity if I use my moral indignation for spreading blind passion all across the country. Now, Tagore was traveling, raising money for Shantiniketan. He was reading of the non-cooperation movement. And he wanted his words of caution and chastisement offered at the time of the Swadeshi movement, 15 years later, which also had a xenophobic tendency, to be made available. So he uh, writes to his nephew, <coughs> uh, Somendranath Tagore, to translate the essays that had appeared in Prabhashi in 1908, which I mentioned, and they appear in 1921 uh, under the auspices of uh, the Madras publisher S. Ganeshan, uh, uh, you know, uh, so that people involved in non-cooperation can see it. And Tagore writes to his nephew saying, I hope an English version will be useful in the present situation in cautioning us Indians against an unproductive hatred of the foreigner. So that's his first reaction. He's in Europe. 
He hears about non-cooperation and he's a little worried about its destructive or xenophobic tendencies. That is lighting the fire, a uh, fire of anger from house to house rather than uh, the lamp of worship. So there he goes to the United States collecting money for Santi Niketan. And he reads in more detail about what's happening in the non-cooperation movement. More people courting arrest, more bonfires, more satyagraha, more police beatings, and so on and so forth. And then he writes to Andrews in January 1921, I feel deeply hurt when I find that man's personality is mutilated in the Western world and reduced to a machine. But this process of curtailment of humanity is often advocated in our country under the name of patriotism. And then he says, you know, uh, I believe my countrymen will have no patience with me because I believe truth and God to be higher in my own country. And then in another letter posted from Chicago on March 5th, 1921 to C.F. Andrews, he says, what an irony of fate it should be. This is writing from Chicago in 1921. What an irony of fate it should be that I should be preaching cooperation of cultures between East and West on this side of the sea, just at the moment as the doctrine of non-cooperation is preached on the other side of the sea. So Tagore had reservations about the spirit of non-cooperation from the start. Soon, he began having reservations about its leader. While he was in North America, a recent article by Mahatma Gandhi that was published in Young India was brought to his attention, entitled, Evil Wrought by the English Medium. This article by Gandhi claimed, I quote, Ram Mohan Roy would have been a greater reformer and Lokmanya Tilak would have been a greater scholar if they had not to start with the handicap of having to think in English and transmit their thoughts chiefly in English. Gandhi continues, of all the superstitions that affect India, none is so great that a knowledge of the English language is necessary for imbibing ideas of liberty. As a result of the system of education based on English, the tendency has been to dwarf the Indian body, mind and soul. I mean, you can see this, these are all contemporary arguments. But Tagore was dismayed by the tenor of Gandhi's argument and by its chastisement of Ram Mohan Roy in particular. I mean, Ram Mohan Roy is a very major figure in, in Tagore's uh, intellectual and personal development. And his entire family lineage is, in a sense, traced back to the Brahma Samaj founded by Ram Mohan Roy. So he reads this article by Gandhi and he writes to C.F. Andrews. He says, I strongly protest against Mahatma Gandhi cutting down Ram Mohan Roy in his blind zeal for crying down our modern education. These criticisms, added Tagore, showed that Gandhi is growing enamored of his own doctrines, a dangerous form of egotism that even great people suffer from at times. That Mahatma Gandhi is becoming enamored of his own doctrines, which even great people suffer from at times. <laughs> Gandhi believed that Ram Mohan Roy was limited by his excessive familiarity with English. To the contrary, Tagore argued that through his engagement with other languages, the reformer had the comprehensiveness of mind to be able to realize the fundamental unity of spirit in the Hindu, Mohammedan, and Christian. Tagore continues, therefore Roy represented India in the fullness of truth, and this truth is based not on rejection, but on perfect comprehension. Ram Mohan Roy, could be perfectly natural in his acceptance of the West, not only because his education had been perfectly Eastern. In fact, Ramon Roy's first book was in Persian, with a preface in Arabic. And of course, he wrote many books in Bengali too. So it, Gandhi was playing wrong to think that he was just an English-speaking or English-writing intellectual. So Tagore says, Ramon Roy could be natural in accepting the West because he had, his education had been perfectly Eastern. He was because he was never a schoolboy of the West, he had the dignity to be a friend of the West. So here were these letters. Tagore was writing Andrews in 1921. They were, Andrews was the intermediary between Tagore and Gandhi. He was a close friend of both. And then Andrews did something uh, which is still done quite often today by friends, which is to leak the letter to the press. <laughs> now, I don't know. Gopal might know whether he had Tagore's permission in doing this, 
But he leaked these letters to the press. You know, Tagore's uh, chastisement of Gandhi. And I think we should thank Andrews for this, because it was a memorable debate. And the most memorable part of it is still to come, <laughs> which is Gandhi's response. So Andrews leaks these letters to the press. And Gandhi is stung by the criticisms. And he wants to respond. And he writes in Young India several articles responding to Tagore's criticism that he was xenophobic, chauvinistic, arrogant, enamored of his own doctrines, and so on and so forth. And he says, you know, I'm not chauvinistic. I have uh, friends with many English people, C.F. Andrews among them. I mean, it's a wonderful, you know, sends a wonderful tribute to Gandhi and to Andrews and to the spirit of the national movement in those days that Gandhi's closest friend was an Englishman, C.F. Andrews. If you admired Gandhi, which many Indians did, you called him Gandhiji or Bapu. If you disliked Gandhi, as also many Indians did, you called him Mr. Gandhi or M.K. Gandhi. You know? So Jinnah and the communists always called him Mr. Gandhi or M.K. Gandhi. Now, on the other hand, you admired him, you said Gandhiji and Bapu. So far as I know, the only person in adult life to call Gandhi Mohan was C.F. Andrews. So he said, look, here's my closest friend, an Englishman. Uh, you know, the other Englishmen who are part of the movement, Annie Besant has been a, who's an Irish woman, has been president of the Congress. So how could you call me chauvinistic or xenophobic? And then he ends his defense with these words. So these words are very important, and I'm going to read them out to you, because you recognize some of them, but not all of them. So he's defending himself to Tagore. Gandhi is saying, I'm not a xenophobe. I'm not a chauvinist. I appreciate, you know, uh, the light of a lamp lit anywhere in the world as much as you. And he said, says it in these words. These are Gandhi's words. I quote, I hope I am as great a believer in free air as the poet. I do not want my house to be walled in on all sides and my windows to be stuffed. I want the cultures of all the lands to be blown about my house as freely as possible, but I refuse to be blown off my feet by any. Now, many of you would have heard part of this quote. No modern man has provided posterity as many quotable lines or phrases as Gandhi, or I should perhaps add as many misattributed or misquoted lines or phrases as Gandhi also. You know, a friend of mine who is active in British politics very proudly wrote to me, saying, you know, I'm working for uh, a candidate in the Labour Party elections. I think his name is Jeremy Corbyn, and I'm writing his speeches. And you'll be very pleased that I put these two phrases of Gandhi uh, uh, in his latest speech. And I have to write to him saying, Gandhi never made these remarks. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so, but this is what Gandhi said. And among the remarks that Gandhi did make, the sentences I've cited, I do not want my house to be walled in on all sides, my windows to be stuffed. I want the cultures of all the lands to be blown about my house as freely as possible, but I refuse to be blown off my feet by any. These sentences must be among the most regularly quoted of the millions of words the Mahatma wrote or spoke. They are to be found in classrooms, in museums, in auditoria, in manners, always as a succinct statement of Gandhi's openness to other cultures while remaining loyal to his own. However, while I have quoted four sentences, those other invocations of this quote that you'll find all over schools and auditoria and manners, always remove the crucial opening sentence, which reads, I hope I am as great a believer in free air as the great poet. So it was really Tagore, it was really Tagore who compared Gandhi to move from what could have been an unreasoning uh, parochialism to a more open-minded nationalism. And perhaps, you know, anyone here wants to quote those words, don't forget the first line. I hope I have as great a believer in free air as the poet. So in a sense, Tagore squeezes it out of Gandhi. Tagore's uh, dismay at Japanese militarism in the 1930s. You know, Tagore loved Japan. He visited Japan four times. He went to China also often. A deep appreciation of Japanese culture and aesthetics. But in the late 1930s, he was appalled by Japanese militarism. And he had a famous exchange uh, with the Japanese poet Yoni Naguchi, which I was going to talk about. But I'll skip in the interest of time. Because, no, no, you're going. You know, I think it kind of, uh, uh, you know, it, it, in a sense, it's, uh, it flows from what I've said. It's just one more illustration. I've got to end my talk with three final quotations. 
from the God. One displays his political prescience. It comes from his visit to the Soviet Union in 1930, when he was in his 70th year. I mean, when you talk about the difficulty of travel, it is, you know, as I said, I mean, this, this, on Gandhi, this, this may be a slightly one-sided perspective of debate. I mean, the other, very others, other sides. One is in September 1932, when Gandhi goes on fast on the question of separate electorates for uh, so-called untouchables. And Tagore travels uh, from Shantiniketan to Yarawada jail in Pune to be with him. And you're talking, I mean, I'm sure there are some people in this room who, I mean, I no longer travel by second class railway. But Tagore at 70, I mean, it's incredibly arduous. I mean, talking August, September, if you go from Calcutta to Pune, you're passing through the hottest and most humid parts of India. And this old man, sick man, wants to go. And of course, uh, fittingly, he's there when Gandhi breaks his fast. And it's, uh, that's, a, that, that's an event that's been much memorialized and rightly. So, uh, so he, he was, had a zest, he was zest for travel. He wanted to go to Russia. And of course, Nehru also wanted to go to Russia. Nehru went to Russia in 1927 when he was 38. Tagore goes, goes to Russia when he's twice his age. Because he wants to find out what's happening here after the Bolshevik Revolution. Uh, he spends two weeks there. Uh, he visits schools and factories. He sees films directed by Eisenstein and operas by Rimsky Korsakov. He listens, he speaks, and in one city even exhibits his paintings. In letters written home, which are collected in a now out of print volume edited by uh, the economist Prashant Chandra Mahalovis, who's a controversial figure in economics today because planning is discredited. But whatever you may think of his economics, uh, he had a phenomenal knowledge of Tagore's over, you know. He knew every word of Tagore by heart. And if Tagore had forgotten a poem, he would ask Prashant Chandra Mahalovis to finish it for him. <laughs> so, uh, so he was actually quite, quite a remarkable man. And, there's this book published in 1930, which, which I have, from, which I got from a second-hand bookshop in Bangalore. It may have been republished uh, uh, by Shanti Niketan recently by Vishwabhati. I hope so. It's an account of the Tagore's trip to the Soviet Union in 1930, based on letters home by Prashant Tatandra Mahanlobis. Uh, which Tagore, uh, to, letters by Tagore, which Mahanlobis transcribes into English and then publishes. In these letters, Tagore expresses a measure of admiration for the Soviet experiment. As a result of the Russian Revolution, he's telling his friends in Bengal, suffering humanity has a nobler vision of itself on the world stage than before. Russia has raised the seat of power for the dispossessed. That's what he says. He thinks that, you know, there's a sense of equality and leveling. Aristocratic Russia has given way to a sense of equality. Russia has raised the seat of power for the dispossessed. But this appreciation was not, not unqualified. Before leaving the Soviet Union, Tagore gave an interview to the newspaper Izvestia. Uh, here he praised the amazing intensity with which the Soviets had spread education. Then he added these caveats. He writes, these are his quotes, he's addressing the Izvestia journalist. He says, I must ask you, are you doing your ideal a service by arousing in the minds of those under your training anger, class, hatred, and vengefulness against those not sharing your ideals, against those you consider your enemies? I repeat, I must ask you, are you doing your ideal a service by arousing anger, hate, vengefulness against those who don't agree with you? True, you have to fight against obstacles. You have to overcome ignorance and lack of sympathy, even persistent antagonism. But, says Tagore to the Soviet journalist, your mission is not restricted to your own party or your own nation. It is for the betterment of humanity. But does not humanity include those who do not agree with your aim? In Togo's opinion, the political system of any country or culture must permit, and this is his, this, these are his words, disagreement where minds are allowed to be free. For, he continues, for it would not only be an uninteresting but a sterile world of mechanical regularity if all opinions were made forcibly alike. It would be a sterile world of mechanical regularity if all opinions were made forcibly alike. If you have a mission that includes all humanity, because that's what Marxists always claim, that it's a universalizing mission. If you have a mission that includes all humanity, 
acknowledge the existence of differences of opinion, for knowledge only occurs when opinions are changed and rechanged through the free circulation of intellectual forces and moral persuasion. Violence begets violence and blind stupidity. Freedom of mind is needed for the reception of truth. Terror, terror hopelessly kills it. Terror hopelessly kills freedom of mind. And then, this is 1930, by the way, which is before, the, before collectivization and the gulag and so on. He says, this is the last quote I'm going from, from this uh, interview to his best here. Therefore, for the sake of humanity, tells his Russian course, I hope that you may never create a force of violence which will go on weaving an in interminable chain of violence and cruelty. Already you have inherited much of this legacy from the Tsarist regime. It is the worst legacy you could possibly have. You have destroyed many of the other evils of that regime. Why not destroy this one too? Now, uh, one thing I do not know. I have a speculation, but I don't have a clear answer. And what I do not know is whether this interview was ever published in his best year. <laughs> and this is not a facile question, you know. As you see, famously said, I think Pravda means truth and his best uh, means news. And it was famously said, there is no Pravda in his best year, I know his best year in Pravda. And this, this is a description of what Tagore told an his best year journalist as transcribed by Prashanta Mahalovis and conveyed uh, to friends in Bengal and published uh, by privately in, in Calcutta in 1930. You know, uh, I don't read Russian. I haven't gone to the microfilms of Izvestia, but I rather suspect that these words would not have been published in Stalin's Russia. But they're worth recalling today for the extraordinary prescience with which he recognized, you know, uh, that this great movement inspired by the ideals of equality and fraternity, would crush and obliterate freedom of expression and opinion. So that's the first quote I gave you. The second quote I'm going to give you is from Nationalism, his book of 1916, 1917, I beg your pardon. And this quote I'm offering to make the point that Tagore's criticisms always had a constructive edge. Tagore could denounce the nation of the West while acclaiming the spirit of the West. For Tagore, Europe had produced imperialism and militarism on one side and liberty and justice on the other. Imperialism and militarism on one side and liberty and justice on the other. And to resist imperialism and militarism, you could actually use the resources of liberty and justice, which also came from Europe. So he says, beautifully in his book, Nationalism, he says, there is one safety upon which we may count. And that is, we can claim Europe herself as our ally in our resistance to her temptations and to her violent encroachments. For she has ever carried her own standards of perfection by which we can measure her falls and gauge her degrees of failure by which we can call her before her own tribunal and put her to shame. I, you know, this is a slightly wordy passage, which is not uh, uh, unusual, because Tagore could be wordy, and English was not his first language in any case, and this is the first substantial thing he wrote in English. But if you look at what he's trying to say, more simply, we can claim Europe herself as our ally in our, in our resistance to her temptations and her violent encroachments because we got imperialism and militarism from the West, the cult of the machine, the cult of the nation, but liberty and equality too. I mean, despite the tortuous arguments of Indic philosophers and sociologists and so on and so forth, uh, you know, I think this is absolutely true. I mean, the and basic movements for social equality, for gender rights, you know, many other things come from the West. I mean, Gandhi and Ambedkar, who in many ways are the two greatest social reformers in India, you know, uh, helped, uh, in a sense, uh, facilitate India's ongoing and complicated and tortuous encounter with the modern world. Uh, None of this. That the, you know, the West had sh uh, sh shone a sharp searchlight on, on our own society, on our own frailties, on our own, uh, you know, uh, cleavages. And Tagore says this. So you can use Europe itself. You can use its most creative, its most innovative thinkers 
to resist its own encroachments. Because you had precocious European critics of imperialism and militarism, uh, uh, precocious European fighters for women's rights, for individual freedom, and so on. And you can claim Europe itself as an ally against its violent, uh, violent temptations and encroachments. I'm, I'm coming to my last paragraph, and allow me to read it up. Last two paragraphs. Tagore knew that no nation, culture, ideology, or religious tradition had a monopoly of vice, nor a monopoly of virtue either. All systems of belief, all national cultures, all political ideologies were a mixture of good and evil, of truth and untruth. The only way to make one's nation or culture less false was to broaden it by listening to and learning from other nations and cultures. Recall a hundred years later the warnings against cultural arrogance that he issued in his essays of 1908. It is not as if at the bar of the judgment seat of the Almighty, different advocates are engaged in pleading the rival causes of Hindu, Muslim, or Westerner, and the party that wins the decree shall finally plant the standard of permanent possession. Addressed to the bigots and xenophobes of his own day, these remarks of Tagore can be addressed once again to those who today wish to forcibly impose their convictions on the rest of humanity. They should and could and must be addressed to Al-Qaeda and to extremist Hindus, to evangelical Christians and to revolutionary Maoists, to all those who fanatically and violently seek to take permanent possession of the past and future of humankind. Thank you.